record now, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Daniel. Thanks. Um, so uh, this talk, uh, it's 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 a lot of slides, but I think we can get through it actually uh, probably in, in hopefully the amount of time we need. There's just there's a lot to say about snakes, and um, there's usually a lot of questions to get answered. Um, but I'll, I'll try and, and not dwell on any one thing for too long because we have 40 some odd species of snakes and there's no way for me to go through every single one. But what, what I've got here is what uh, John Jensen, the herpetologist before me, he started this talk, the original version of it. And um, it just highlights some of the more interesting things, um, some of the unique ones and some of the really common ones and, and things like that. And so we're going to get around to probably three quarters of the snakes of Georgia at least. Um, you'll at least get to see, see a picture of one and, and what they are. And unfortunately I can't bring uh, a live snake to you. That was my original plan with this kind of stuff is to bring, um, actual snakes and show people. But, uh, this, I guess this will have to do given the times that we have. So here's a, here's a map of snake diversity in Georgia by County. And, uh, I actually just noticed, I think that's Paulding County. That's actually a little bit darker purple shaded up there maybe um it is <laughs> yeah yeah um so you can kind of see uh, county by county where most of our snake species are so it ranges from anywhere like if you're up in the mountains uh it's it's lower snake diversity maybe 21 to 24 species in those counties but then as you move south and you get into the coastal plain it jumps way up and some counties there have you know 30 to 30 some odd uh, species of snakes. There's actually a lot of different kinds of snakes out there in the state. Um, and depending on how you break it down, there's a total of 40, anywhere from 41 to 46, depending on how much of a lumper or splitter you are. This says 45. Um, you know, it depends. But we have the second highest snake diversity in the eastern U.S. Uh, I think, I think Texas um, might beat us for snake diversity, and, and that's about it for the eastern U.S. That's pretty, it's pretty good. We got a lot of snakes. Um, all of those snakes in Georgia fall into three families, um, our, our native snakes at least. Uh, the elapids, which are the cobras and crates and mambas, uh, we only have one species in that family, um, and that's the eastern coral snake, uh, famous for being a, a very um, the, the venom of that snake being very different, being very toxic from a lot of our other snakes. Uh, and then we have pit vipers. We have five species of pit vipers. Those are the rattlesnakes and copperheads and cotton mouths. That's most of our venomous species. And then the vast majority are what we call colubrids, uh, family colubridae. Uh, depending on who you talk to, that family is now split up into a few different families. Uh, but more or less, those are all the uh, harmless snakes in Georgia and that, that's a vast majority of our species and then we have this thing called a blind snake unfortunately I don't have a pointer on here I realized I did this last night with a different group and I, I couldn't see my uh, cursor um, on there but in the lower right hand corner there's something called a blind snake that's an exotic species it's not native to Georgia but it does turn up from time to time uh, in people's gardens and things like that uh, so this is our largest snake. Uh, it's actually the longest snake in the U.S. Uh, this is the eastern indigo snake, a very rare species found in South Georgia in sandhill uh, habitats, places where you have gopher tortoises and uh, pocket gophers and, and things like that. Um, but eight and a half feet long is the record for the indigo snake. A really big one is probably more like seven feet, but they do get very long uh, and, and pretty thick. I mean, they can weigh a few pounds easily. Uh, there's somebody holding one. You can see uh, that's a pretty good sized snake. Um, and you can kind of get a good idea of the habitat they're found in in the background, really sandy areas, lots of palmettos and grass and stuff. Uh, the coach whip also gets to be about the same length. Uh, eight, eight plus feet long. And uh, they're, but they're a lot skinnier. They get the name coach whip from that braided whip pattern that you can see in the scales, especially on the tail. 
kind of looks like a braided whip. But it's a very long, slender snake that gets almost as long as the coach whip or as the uh, indigo snake. And there, there's somebody holding one up there. You can see how it's taller than he is. That's a you know six and a half foot snake or something like that. <laughs> I just noticed, yeah, that bad idea generally to hold uh, beers and um, catch snakes. That's that's how you get bit by something. Um, so don't do what these guys are doing. Fortunately, it's a harmless snake they're messing with. This one's not so harmless. This is another really big snake. Uh, this is the longest venomous snake in uh, the United States. And uh, also it's the heaviest snake of any kind in the United States. Uh, this is the Eastern Diamondback, up to eight feet long. That, you know, <clears throat> almost never happens nowadays in, in, except in captivity. Uh, six feet would be a really big one. And, uh, but they can grow, you know, six feet, uh, seven, eight, 10 pounds, maybe, uh, several pounds at least. And uh, eight feet long is, is kind of the record size for those. That's a, that's a really big snake. There's Bruce Means, um, famous herpetologist from Florida, did a lot of research on diamondbacks, holding one up. Um, nowadays, we don't, we don't generally hold snakes like that anymore. So Again, don't don't do what you see in these pictures. Um, you see a lot of pictures of snakes of all kinds, especially rattlesnakes held up uh, that, that look bigger than they are. So there's the guy on the left there. Again, a great example of what not to do. This guy has killed the snake, and um, he's holding it up on a stick or something. Uh, you can clearly see the... The beer can, that's uh, another sign that someone's doing something they shouldn't do. But uh, that's an Eastern Diamondback, and he's holding it. It's a big snake. It's probably a five and a half to six foot snake. But the way he's holding it up closer to the camera, as you can see on the, the example on the right, you can make something that's not all that big look a lot bigger by holding it close to the camera. That's something you see in pictures a lot where people you know, just make things out, seem, make things out to... Uh, look more like monsters than they, than they really are. Um, there you go. You can see one uh, really fat. This uh, snake's big enough that uh, they'll actually eat rabbits. Uh, as adults, diamondbacks eat a lot of rabbits. It's one of their main prey items. Uh, this is our smallest venomous snake, or at least our shortest one, the pygmy rattlesnake. Um, they get to be, it says two and a half feet. That would be a, a very, very large one. That'd probably be like record size. Uh, two feet would be a really big one. Most of the time they're 18 to 20 inches long as adults. Uh, and they are venomous. Uh, they're not uh, especially deadly, but they do bite a lot of people in Florida. And occasionally someone in South Georgia gets bit. Um, but um, it's not something that people see a lot, partly because they're small. And uh, people don't notice them when they're coiled up. Uh, they're maybe the size of a drink coaster or something like that. And so, you know, most of the time you wouldn't even notice it in the woods if you walked by it. There's a, a juvenile. You can tell it's a, a young snake, a young pygmy rattlesnake because of the yellow tail. They, along with copperheads and cottonmouths, often have yellow tails when they are born. And uh, they use that to lure prey, lizards and frogs and things. They'll wiggle their tail and get things to move closer so they can eat them. But there, there's a little one next to a penny. That's maybe a, you know, a few months old or something like that. Uh, here's our, uh, our tiniest snake in general, uh, smallest native snake, I should say, uh, the Florida crown snake. These are really rare in Georgia, um, very tiny range, you know, maybe down around Valdosta would be the only place you might find them. Uh, but they are a very tiny snake. They eat invertebrates, uh, completely harmless. Here's the smallest snake uh, in general. You know, if you include non-natives, this is the Brahmini blind snake, also sometimes called the flower pot snake because they are commonly found in nursery stock in uh, plants that are moved from nurseries. Uh, they're actually kind of a tropical snake. They're, they're well established in Florida, and uh, what really throughout the world, they're actually native to Southeast Asia, but they've been moved around the world in uh, plants and soil and things like that. And they do turn up in Georgia from time to time. 
so you know, if you if you go to a plant sale and you buy some plants and they've been shipped from Florida, sometimes sometimes there's a Brahmini blind snake in there. They're harmless. They eat ants and termites. They probably don't actually do uh, any damage or anything. They can't bite you. Uh, they're about the size of a worm, and, and most people would mistake them for a worm until they saw the tongue flick out. We have uh, snakes do a lot of different things. So we talked about, you know, kind of just sizes of snakes that you might see. And uh, you also see snakes doing a lot of different things, living different ways. We have some snakes that are pretty arboreal, so they climb trees a lot. Uh, the corn snake on the left, they're really good at climbing. You can see that snakes uh, wedged his body into the cracks of some pine bark climbing up uh, the side of a tree. And then uh, on the right there, you can just see its head poking out. The rough green snakes are really pretty, uh, kind of medium sized snake, bright green. They like to live in shrubs and vines and they can climb trees pretty well. They mostly eat insects. And we have snakes that dig a lot that are fossorial, meaning they spend a lot of time digging underground or, or in the burrows of other animals sometimes. Uh, the southern hognose snake, it's a really rare snake. We have two species of hognose snake in Georgia. Uh, the southern hognose is, is uh, very rare. It was actually a uh, petition to be listed under the Endangered Species Act not too long ago, uh, and it, was, it, it did not wind up getting listed, but uh, the state of Georgia lists it as, as threatened. And then um, the pine snake on the right, uh, both of these snakes are uh, really good at digging in loose sand and things like that. Pine snakes actually like to live in burrows of other animals though. Uh, they'll use pocket gopher burrows and other small mammal burrows. Uh, they spend a lot of time underground. And that's, that's one thing that uh, you do have in Paulding County uh, a decent number of that, that uh, maybe isn't common in a lot of places in um, North Georgia, but, but that kind of West Atlanta area, there are some pine snakes. Uh, some snakes like to live in cracks and rocks. This is the eastern milk snake. Uh, it's mostly found in the mountains in Georgia, and it really likes to live in rock crevices like you see in the, the picture there. And then we have a lot of snakes that are aquatic. Uh, most people, when they think of aquatic snakes, they automatically think of water snakes and cotton mouths, but they're, those are actually not our most aquatic snakes. We have some snakes that almost never leave the water, uh, like the black swamp snake on the left, they're, they're a small snake, maybe a foot long or so. And then the striped crayfish snake on the right, these spend almost all their time in wetlands, actually in the water. And so they're very rarely seen except for uh, usually just either if you're actually looking for them, with you know, trapping for them or something. But uh, sometimes you see them crossing the road. Both of these are found in South Georgia, places where you have a lot of swampy wetlands that they can live in. All right, so snakes do a lot of different things. Now we're gonna talk about some things snakes don't do. Uh, there are a lot of myths surrounding snakes. Uh, and, and so there's, here there's gonna be highlighted just a handful of those that we can dispel. Uh, one, you may have heard of like hoop snakes. And so this is a, this actually, that's not a real photo. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a painting, I believe. But people believe that snakes uh, at least certain kinds, and it depends on which, uh, who you talk to as to which snakes are, are considered hoop snakes, which ones will do that, but uh, none of them actually do. And the idea was that snakes could roll into a hoop like this, kind of bite onto their tail and then roll down the hill and chase you and bite you or sting you or whatever uh, people say, but no, no snakes actually do that. Um, some people say snakes can hypnotize their prey you know, I think I've even seen this in, uh, what was that cartoon? Ricky Ticky Tavi, I believe the cobras can hypnotize uh, people to bite them or, you know, prey to eat them or whatever. But uh, that no snakes can't hypnotize their prey. They got to earn an honest living just like every other animal. And they, uh, they have to uh, stay hidden and, and either wait on prey to get close enough or some of them actually uh, go actively looking for prey like indigo snakes and, and uh, coach whips that we talked about earlier, those long slender snakes, those are built for <coughs> moving, moving pretty fast and chasing things down. Um, there's also the myth that uh, milk snakes can uh, drink the milk from cattle. Uh, snakes don't drink milk. 
uh, that is for mammals. They don't even uh, have any interest in it. Uh, but that was the myth. I think it comes from the fact that milk snakes were commonly found around uh, dairy operations in certain places, you know, in, in the mountains maybe, where you have uh, places where you're storing a lot of grain, a lot of feed for, for livestock. And um, basically they, uh, they saw the snakes there because there were rodents there eating the grain. And so there's a lot of snakes there, but for some reason, they thought it was a simpler explanation that the snakes were there to get milk from the cows. Uh, so these are some myths that, you know, those, those first myths, those were kind of the more ridiculous, unbelievable things. But these are some things that uh, maybe are uh, more just misunderstandings than myth. And uh, these are a lot more common and uh, a, a lot of, you know, a lot of people believe them or think them even though and they're because they're fair, they're fairly believable and uh, so these are not maybe as much myths as misunderstandings but the first one uh, snakes eat mice and rats and that's something that you know you hear a lot from people that like, like snakes like myself uh, if you if you like um, if you don't like rodents um, living in and around your house then uh, you should like snakes uh, and that's that's true in part. I mean, there's there are some snakes that eat rodents, um, uh, quite a few actually, but but not all of them. You can see out of 46 or so species of snakes, um, less than half, 39 percent, eat rodents. Uh, like the copperhead, they actually eat a lot of rodents. Uh, I found one in my driveway just the other night. It was kind of the last warm night we had, and I was driving up the driveway one evening. There was one in the in the driveway. Uh, and I just, just kind of escorted him off the driveway and left him be. Uh, but they do eat a lot of rodents. Um, timber rattlesnakes eat rodents. They eat a lot of squirrels and chipmunks and uh, mice and things they find in the woods. Pine snakes eat uh, a variety of rodents as well. Uh, in, the, in the coastal plain, they'll, they like to eat pocket gophers. And then in the northern parts of the state, they're eating more like cotton rats and other common mice and, and rats. But then we have snakes like, like the red-bellied snake, really common around homes and, and gardens, uh, does not eat rodents at all. In fact, it doesn't even get big enough to, it only grows to be you know, maybe six, eight inches long normally. And they mostly eat invertebrates. They're mostly eating the slugs you find in your garden, snails, uh, grubs, you know, the, the larvae of, of beetles and things like that. The southeastern crown snake, it doesn't eat rodents. Again, this is another small snake. Uh, they eat uh, invertebrates as well. They mostly eat, uh, what they found is that they eat a lot of centipedes, which uh, I don't know if you know much about centipedes, but they're venomous. They, some of them get to be almost the size of a crown snake. And so that's, that's a pretty bad little snake to take down a, a centipede. Uh, but that, that's a lot of what they eat. The scarlet snake, they've got a really unusual diet. They uh, will eat um, other snakes sometimes and lizards, but what they really like are their eggs. They, they really specialize in eating the eggs of other reptiles, and that's almost all they eat. We have a lot of snakes that eat fish and things like that. This is the brown water snake. Eats, um, not only does it eat fish, but it has a, uh, a really uh, ten, a tendency to eat bullhead catfish. It really likes that one family of fish and it eats a lot of, of small catfish. And people have find, found them actually, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, catfish, they have spines that stick out that are really sharp. And people have found these snakes with spines protruding from their body. But apparently they're able to digest the fish on the inside and then the spine just kind of falls out and then the wound heals up and the snake is fine. Hognose snakes uh, are famous for just eating amphibians, especially frogs and toads. That's, that's really uh, pretty much all they eat are frogs and toads, uh, maybe the occasional salamander. Rainbow snakes have a really restricted diet. They're one of the few things we have that only eat one other species of animal. Uh, it's a really, really pretty snake found in South Georgia. It likes to live in uh, rivers and streams. 
and they only eat American eels. That's all they'll eat is American eels. And that's actually a conservation concern for this, this snake is that uh, when we put dams up on a lot of our rivers, we prevented eels from being able to migrate up from the ocean as juveniles and then grow and live in, in our freshwater rivers. And uh, as the snake's prey dies out, the snake is, is uh, well, it dies out too in places. We still have rainbow snakes, but we don't know a lot about them. This is another one of those snakes, like I talked about, that are almost entirely aquatic. They almost never leave the water. And so uh, they're not seen a lot. We don't know a whole lot about them other than the kinds of places they like to live and the fact that they only eat American eels. The mud snake is related to the rainbow snake. Uh, both of these snakes are actually pretty good size. The rainbow snake maybe three or four feet long. And the mud snake actually gets pretty big, easily five or six feet long. And uh, mud snakes, again, almost entirely aquatic. They only eat large aquatic salamanders, in particular amphiumas and sirens, which are, if, if you didn't know any better, if you caught these salamanders, you would think they were some kind of eel. Um, these salamanders can grow to be, you know, three, three and a half feet long themselves. And, uh, but that's, that's what these mud snakes eat. And uh, both rainbow snakes and mud snakes, as well as the worm snake, which you can see in that bottom picture there, uh, have a little sharp spine on the tip of their tail. And all three of these snakes eat long, slender, slimy things. Worm snakes eat mostly earthworms. They're, they're small, you, um, but the, uh, even the other two, the bigger snakes have this spine and we think that that is um, an adaptation to be able to grab onto long slimy things that are struggling to get away when you eat them. They, they don't have hands and so they use the tip of their tail to kind of grab onto you. And I think this is part of where the myth of the stinging hoop snake comes from is that when you, when you handle them, they will kind of prod at you with this spine on the tip of the tail. They can't pierce the skin or anything. It's, it doesn't hurt. Um, but, but, you know, maybe people thought they were trying to sting you or something like that. Uh, this is the queen snake. Uh, this is something you could find around Paulding County. Uh, they only eat freshly molted crayfish. So not only do they just eat crayfish, but they select crayfish that have recently molted, shed their exoskeleton so they're still soft if you've ever had a uh, soft shelled crab you can you know they're you fry them whole and, and eat, eat them shell and all and, and uh, crayfish are the same way after they molt and so that's what this snake um, almost exclusively eats. Uh, Cottonmouths are aggressive this is something we hear a lot uh, there are cotton mouths up uh, in West Georgia, up in the Piedmont, so in, in kind of the Paulding area and for sure west of there. And um, people think they chase them. That is not true. There's actually been a lot of experimentation done that shows it's, it's not. And uh, so this is what they look like. They get, they're famous for uh, having this white lining on the inside of the mouth. That's where they get the name cotton mouth. And, and if you harass them or scare them enough, they will gape their mouth open like this as a warning to let you know they're there and to uh, warn you to stay away. It's actually really hard to get one to bite you. Uh, this, this is a study that was done at Savannah River site in South Carolina. And uh, so uh, Mike Dorcas, Whit Gibbons, and Mark Mills went and um, harassed a lot of cotton mouths <laughs> and, and recorded their response. Uh, so they would go up to a snake a cotton mouth and stand next to it with snake boots on um, so that just in case it did try to bite, they had some protection. Uh, I should point out though that you should not do this uh, normally. They had, a, they had a specific reason for standing next to these snakes, but snake boots are not snake proof. Uh, they will prevent most snakes from being able to bite through them. But a really big snake, if it hit the boot in the right spot or if the boot's kind of worn out in places, uh, they're, they're not snake proof. So don't, don't trust your life on them. Uh, it's better just to watch where you're walking when you're in the woods. I don't, I, I'm a herpetologist, I work with snakes. Sometimes I go looking for snakes and I don't wear snake boots. I just watch where my feet are going and I wear normal, comfortable leather hiking boots. Uh, but they, they would stand next to them and they would record their response. Uh, they would actually step on them, not, not hard enough to hurt them, but actually 
put their foot on top of the snake and see what they did. And then they would reach down and pick it up. That's not an actual hand. That is a, uh, a set of like snake tongs with a glove on them. And then they would actually put hand warmers in them so that it would be warm and the snake could, it would actually simulate a person's hand. There you can see Wit uh, hold, holding a snake up with this fake human arm uh, to see what they would do. And so here's uh, kind of an example of what they, what they found is that uh, the moral of the story is here is if you want to get bitten by a cottonmouth, most of the time you have to pick it up. Uh, standing beside the snake, I don't think any snakes bit. Um, and then, you know, picking it up, the, the chances increased somewhat. But even then, uh, not all the snakes bit. They, they really had no interest in, in biting people. Uh, the snake myth number three, cottonmouths occur throughout Georgia. A lot of people, anywhere they're at in the state, they will see a cottonmouth and think that it, uh, or see, I'm sorry, see a cottonmouth. They see a snake near the water, and they think it's a cottonmouth. Uh, here's a quick range map for cottonmouths. You can see maybe uh, sort of the southwestern end of Paulding County uh, and then westward. There are some, but for the most part, in most of North Georgia, uh, there are no cottonmouths. They're just in that shaded area. So you can see primarily South Georgia and then coming up the west side of the state a little bit and then maybe up to, you know, just east of Athens to maybe Oglethorpe County or so. Uh, but most of our large reservoirs have no cottonmouths there. So Lake Altoona, Lake Lanier, all the mountain reservoirs, Lake Oconee, for the most part, uh, there are no, no cottonmouths there. This is what people are typically seeing are, are some of our, our water snakes, which are harmless and can maybe look like cottonmouths at times, especially if, if uh, you don't know, uh, if you're not a snake expert, you don't know what you're looking at, uh, you, you might mistake a water snake for a cottonmouth. Uh, most small snakes are babies. We have a lot of snakes that are really small. I, I get a call every now and then on one of these. They say, uh, I've got a baby copperhead in my yard. And most of the time, in fact, every time so far, granted, I've only been on this job for a year, but in the last year, I've got a lot of calls about baby copperheads in yards. And so far, almost all of them have been brown snakes, which just don't grow very big and are harmless. And, um, None of them have been copperheads. These are uh, all snake species that, that don't grow uh, more than 12 inches long in Georgia. They all stay small. Small, harmless snakes. Uh, some of them, like the red-bellied and brown snakes and worm snakes, are fairly common in, in people's yards and gardens. Uh, snake myth number five is that it's difficult to distinguish between venomous and non-venomous snakes. People use this as an excuse to kill every snake they see. I should point out that it is actually illegal to kill non-venomous snakes in Georgia. Uh, so if you do have trouble telling them apart, the best thing to do um, is just leave them all alone. But of 46 snake species in Georgia, um, only six of them are venomous, all the others are harmless. So just chances are the snake you see day to day is harmless. Not that all of them are, but really good chance. You know, um, most of them are harmless. Uh, head shape doesn't work out all that well. Uh, these are both harmless snakes that have flattened their head out to make themselves look bigger and look more dangerous, uh, but they're in fact harmless. Snakes, their skulls are flexible. They can flatten them out and uh, make them look kind of triangular like a venomous snake. So head shape doesn't always work that well. Uh, the uh, pupil shape doesn't always work that well. You may have heard that venomous snakes have uh, slit-like pupils, whereas uh, harmless snakes have round pupils. Um, that, that well, I'll show you a picture in a minute where that doesn't work. Uh, underside of the tail, this one's kind of funny to me in that uh, not only does it not work all the time for all snakes, but you actually have to lift the snake's tail up to look. And so um, that's just kind of a bad characteristic because it, it requires you actually looking at the underside of its tail, which is a dangerous thing to do if you do not know what kind of snake it is. So that one's um, 
maybe useful in identifying like a shed snake skin or something like that. But to the average person that sees a snake, it's almost useless. Um, so here's some, here's some characteristics to look for. These, this is just a very general uh, description to use to tell our venomous snakes. So one, the presence of rattles. If you see a rattle on its tail or a button, which means one rattle segment, when rattlesnakes are born, they, uh, they already have one segment on the end of their tail. And then every time they shed, a segment gets added. Uh, but if it has a rattle, it's a rattlesnake, don't touch it. Um, red, yellow, and black bands, that alone doesn't mean it's venomous. But if it has red, yellow, and black bands, and its nose is black, that's a coral snake. Uh, there are no coral snakes in Paulding County. Um, but if you were in South Georgia or something, that might be useful. If the tip of the tail is yellow, just the tip of the tail, that usually means it's a juvenile, a young, copperhead, cottonmouth, or pygmy rattler. Like I said earlier, they have yellow tail tips. Uh, co copperheads <coughs> and young cottonmouths have hourglass-shaped patterns on their body, or some people say they look like Hershey's Kisses. If you're looking at the side of the animal, it would look kind of like a Hershey's Kiss. So they're basically bands that are really narrow on top of the back. Um, and then if its mouth is gaped open and it's white, uh, that's probably a cotton mouth. Uh, other snakes gape their mouths open sometimes, but it's usually pink or red or sometimes black, actually. Uh, uh, rough green snakes will sometimes gape their mouth open at you and it's black. Here's the, the cotton mouth, some examples of cotton mouths. They can be kind of dingy, dark brown or black colored, like that one on the top left, but a lot of them you can make out patterns on them. And then that one young one on the right hand side, you can see those, they're kind of uh, pixelated or grainy, but they are kind of hourglass shaped patterns. And then they have that really dark stripe through the eye. That's a good characteristic. That's something I notice a lot. White stripe through the eye with kind of a white colored uh, upper lip. Uh, that stands out a lot usually. We have a, a brochure uh, that you can actually download the PDF of uh, to help you with identifying some venomous snakes, in particular cotton mouths. Uh, that, there's, there's a link to it there. Uh, maybe I can actually uh, send that link or something to Mary or something like that and she can provide it to y'all. But if you go to our website, um, just Google WRD Georgia. Um, that's our Wildlife Resources Division website, and you can you can search in there. There's a lot of uh, little ham handouts and pamphlets and things like that that you can can look at. So there's the coral snake. Those are two snakes uh, underneath it that have a similar pattern, but notice that their noses are not black. Their noses are red. The coral snake has a black nose. Diamondback rattlesnake, that's uh, pretty straightforward. Got diamonds on its back um, and a rattle. Here's the timber rattlesnake. Again, you, you know, you'll probably see a rattle or at least one button, but uh, otherwise they have uh, these kind of chevron patterns across the back and sometimes a dark, or uh, I said dark, it's, it's more a brown stripe or a red stripe down the center of the back is pretty common too, especially in the uh, central and southern portions of Georgia. Pygmy rattlesnakes, this is uh, one that you wouldn't see that often, but if you do, they have a series of blotches, uh, kind of round uh, alternating blotches or spots down the back. And then again, um, a rattle or at least a button. It's small, it's hard to see. Uh, but, um, you know, if you see a snake with these round alternating blotches down its back, uh, often it'll also have a red stripe like that timber rattler. Uh, it's possible it's a pygmy rattlesnake. And by the way, if you see a pygmy rattlesnake in North Georgia, send me a picture. I'd like to know. We don't have a lot of records of pygmy rattlesnakes in North Georgia. They're there, but they're not, they're not common. And then the copperhead, like I said, that's a really good example of the Hershey's Kiss pattern on the side. Here's a hognose snake. They like, they're harmless, but they like to make themselves look like venomous snakes. They can flatten their necks out and uh, look venomous, but they're, they're not. They're, they're completely harmless. 
pine snakes like to gape their mouth and hiss, but you notice that it's not white, it's kind of pink colored, and it also doesn't have any of the other characteristics we would associate with venomous snakes. Uh, all of these uh, are snakes that at one time or another have been called ground rattlers. There's no, there's no actual snake that's called a ground rattler, although some people call the uh, pygmy rattlesnakes ground rattlers. And um, I think it's because pygmy rattlesnakes are, are uh, or I guess a lot of other snakes can have patterns that maybe look like a pygmy rattlesnake to some people, especially hognose snakes. And um, so just a variety of snakes get called ground rattlers, but these are all um, different snakes that are not rattlesnakes. You can see the bottom two right, uh, right hand corner ones are, are, ven are venomous. And not all snakes look, look, look the same. Brown snake on the top, uh, hognose on the bottom. You see the Eastern hognose has a variable pattern. They don't all look the same. Whereas the brown snake, uh, it, it can vary some as well. Maybe not quite as much as the hognose, but just keep in mind, not all snakes look the same. They, there's variation in pattern. And then as they age, they can change. You can see on the left-hand side is what these snakes look like as juveniles. On the right-hand side is what they look like as an adults. So the rat snake, for instance, has a blotched pattern when it's juvenile. And then at least in the northern part of the state, when they get grown, they turn black. Uh, elsewhere in the state, they could look different. And then there's some other examples there. Similar thing with the racer. The racers start out with blotches and turn black. And then uh, the plain-bellied or red-bellied water snake also loses its blotches as it ages. Some snakes change color after they die. Uh, green snakes actually change blue when they die. Uh, I'm not sure it's really well understood why that happens, but apparently there's a yellow pigment, at least this is one, one hypothesis I've heard of it, that the yellow pigments in the skin break down very quickly after death. And the only thing that's left is the blue color. And so, you know, the snake looks blue after it dies. Uh, we've kind of run kind of, uh, you know, full, full time now. I don't know, Mary, if, if you want to uh, call it. There's, there's still a little bit left, and uh, I guess I've run kind of long. We can... Um, you have, by my watch, you could probably go on for five or ten more minutes, and we okay. still have time for questions. Okay. All right. All right. I'll, I'll try and crank through some more of this stuff. Um, so this one says... Although uh, not a threat to your life, um, Georgia non-moon snakes are still likely to bite humans. We have a, a, a lot of snakes that, that will not bite you at all. And actually, um, you know, the chances of getting bitten by a non-venomous snake are about equal to that of getting by a bird. And I don't know, this is normally where I'd say, how many people have been bitten by a bird? And surprisingly, there's usually a few, but um, not very many people have been bitten by a wild bird because you have to go through some effort to grab that bird. This person is called a cardinal. And, and if you've ever handled cardinals, they can really bite. And they'll, they'll hurt you a lot more so than a, than a non-venomous snake. These are all snakes that never bite. You know, so there's an asterisk there because, um, you know, there's a joke about, you know, somebody sees a dog and they say, uh, does he bite? And the person says, well, he's got teeth, don't he? Anything with a mouth could potentially bite you. But for the most part, these snakes don't bite. And I have handled almost all of these snakes and um, you can't even make them bite you. You can't poke at them enough to get them to bite you. Uh, and so you can see this is several snake species here will not bite. Even if you did pick them up, they don't bite. So you don't, you don't have to worry about them at all. <clears throat> um, Georgia's venomous snakes are a significant threat to humans. Uh, you know, there's a, picture of a cotton mouth looking really gnarly uh, and dangerous. And so people get really scared. They worry, a lot of people worry about snakes a lot. I'm on, I'm on Facebook and I'm in these uh, hunting and fishing groups. Um, and people are always posting about, watch out guys, the snakes are out. You better look out, wear snake boots. You know, what, you know, they're out to get you. And it's just not true. Um, uh, they're, they're not a threat at all. You're much more likely to get injured falling out of your deer stand or tripping in a hole and breaking your leg or getting in a car wreck on the way there, or actually getting struck by lightning, you're probably more likely to die from. Um, there are about 7,000 venomous snake bites per year in the US, and I think that's actually gone down over the last few years. 
uh, and in fact, I know this other statistic has gone down. This is an average of six deaths in the US annually. Actually, over the last 20 years, it's only been about three deaths per year. So call it three to five deaths per year from venomous snakes in the whole country. And most of those are people that don't seek medical treatment. In other words, they get bit and they think it's fine. They don't go to the hospital and they, the, the tissue damage just gets worse and worse and worse. And by the time things are obviously really bad, the snake's already done a lot of damage. And sometimes, sometimes those people wind up dying. But um, for the most part, you're not going to die from a venomous snake. Even if you did get bit by one, you can see here only about one in a thousand people that get bit even by a venomous snake actually wind up dying. Uh, these are some snakes that are venomous that don't kill hardly that many people at all. Um, you can see for that 20 year period, no fatalities from copperheads, cottonmouths, pygmy rattlesnakes or coral snakes. Um, there have been in the last, you know, since 2003, there's been a couple deaths from copperheads. I think one was a, a small child and one was uh, an older, well, not an elderly person, but a person that had heart, heart problems to start with. So there were other, other factors at play. Uh, pygmy rattlesnakes are the number one venomous snake bite in Florida, and uh, no one's died from them. They're just small. They don't have a lot of venom. Uh, Cottonmouths just don't bite a lot of people. They're just not a very bitey snake, and, um, and their venom's not especially strong. Coral snakes have a, a pretty potent venom, but it's really hard to get bit by a coral snake. Uh, you, you, ha you pretty much have to pick them up. You're not going to accidentally get bit by a coral snake. Um, if you uh, treat a snake bite, a venomous snake bite, a rattlesnake, in the U.S. with antivenom, the, the, the chances of mortality are 0.28%. You're almost certainly going to be fine, or at least you're going to live. You might have some scars or something, maybe some, some damage that persists longer than that, you know, some nerve damage and things, but you're going to live. Uh, if, if not treated with antivenin, uh, the mortality rate goes up to 2.6%, which is still really low. Um, but you can see that's 10 times higher. So the moral of the story here is either way, you're probably going to live, but you're going to be a lot better off and a lot more likely to live if you, if you go to the hospital, get treated with antivenin, and uh, that helps uh, reverse the, uh, or, or I guess break down the venom bind it up in your bloodstream so that it can't do more damage. These numbers vary depending on who you talk to, but uh, a large portion of venomous snake bites are dry bites where the snake, even though it's venomous, it doesn't actually inject any venom. 60% um, of snake bites are to the hands. And so that's telling you that most of the time people get bitten by venomous snakes messing with them, trying to catch them or kill them, uh, do something with them. The best thing you can do is just, let them go on their way. Do not get any closer to it than you have to. And uh, that will take care of any of the danger in almost every situation. And um, up to 40% are under the influence of alcohol. Like I said earlier, most of the time this is young men or uh, kids that are drinking and, you know, the, hey, y'all watch this, want to poke at it, pick it up, kill it, whatever. And that, that's how you get bit. This is the only first aid, uh, first aid you need for snake bite. Set of car keys. Um, if you're really not feeling well, if you're if, if it's a big rattlesnake and there's a chance of you, you know, maybe going unconscious at some point or something, uh, maybe have someone else drive you. But just get to the hospital and let them take care of it. Uh, cutting and sucking and all that kind of stuff doesn't work. This is the only thing that works. Uh, Anti venom. It's expensive. If you get if you go to the, the hospital for a venomous snake bite, it will be likely uh, by the time you get out in the hundreds of thousands of dollars for that hospital visit. It's a very expensive trip to the hospital, uh, especially if you have to get anti venom because I think you can see it's two thousand dollars a vial. It's probably more than that now, and um, you, you don't want to have to go through a bunch of that stuff. And uh, that's probably a good place to stop. Uh, and so I will turn it back over to Mary, I suppose, if, if, if there's any questions that people have wrote in. Yeah, Daniel, thank you. Um, that was really interesting. I took some notes about some things. I shared in the chat the link to the Is It a Water Moccasin publication. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll send that out in a follow-up email to, to everyone, too. 
Um, but also I have a couple of questions. Um, one is from one of my master gardeners and he asks, where do snakes go in the winter? Oh, that's good. Yeah. So, um, it depends on the snake and it depends on where you're at and it depends on what the weather's like. You could in Georgia, uh, at least in most of Georgia, you could see a snake almost any month of the year, potentially depending on what kind of snake it is. Uh, but most snakes do become less active in the winter and, uh, they go into something called brumation, which is kind of like hibernation for reptiles. There's some physiological differences, but basically they find a place that they can get, uh, underground usually where they're deep enough that, um, they're not going to freeze. You know, they might get cold and they might just be laying there lethargic and their, their physiology is slowed down. But, but, um, as long as they don't freeze, they can usually survive. And, uh, some snakes have to go deeper. You know, we have some snakes that are more almost tropical, like the indigo snake. You know, that's actually kind of a tropical snake. And the only reason it can survive in Georgia is because of the gopher tortoise. It has to go very deep to not get, it, it, not only can it not freeze, but if it just gets cold, if it gets down into the forties, that snake could die. And so they need a really deep hole. Uh, other snakes like um, copperheads, you know, if they go, you know, if they can get a foot underground, usually that's, that's fine. They can survive. Thanks, Daniel. Um, another question from one of my coworkers is, <laughs> are there um, any snakes that are particularly fond of chicken eggs that might be occurring in Paulding County? Yeah, there, there's one, if you know, there, there are several snakes that will eat eggs sometimes, but the number one, snake that I see uh, around, you know, people getting pictures of in their chicken coops is the rat snake. They not only do they really like to eat bird eggs, but they're also really good at climbing and finding gaps and stuff. And so usually, you know, some people have them, they just, uh, you know, they'll just grab the snake and toss it out and maybe it gets an egg every now and then, but it's not that big of a deal. Uh, if it is a big deal to you, um, try and find out how the snake could get in. Basically, if, if that snake can get its head through a hole, then it can get through the hole. Um, and so maybe changing out the, or, or adding some uh, hardware cloth, which is a finer mesh screen uh, that they can't get through, using some spray foam to seal up gaps between the roof and the, and the rafters and stuff. You know, just, just try and snake proof the, the enclosure. That's, that's probably the best thing you can do and really about the only thing you can do because it is illegal to kill non-venomous snakes. Um, but yeah, you can try and keep them out. So another question from a, a horse owner is, um, is there anything special we might need to do for livestock if they get bitten? Uh, you know, I'm not a vet, but um, I guess a couple things. Uh, horses and cows, because they're so big, will tend to not react as badly to snake venom. In fact, that's used, that used to be how they made antivenom. They would inject a horse with small amounts of venom and then harvest the antibodies to the venom and use that to produce antivenom. Um, you know, but, but uh, yeah, I would say just call your vet uh, if you do suspect a snake bite. Um, oftentimes, there's gonna, it's going to be something else. That doesn't happen very often. I, I've, I don't have any personal experience or heard any verified stories of that happening. I have heard about dogs getting bitten because dogs like to, to mess with things. I got one that loves to stick her head in a hole in the ground. I don't know why, but she has to sniff every hole. Um, and again, just, just get the animal to the vet as quickly as possible if you suspect it's a snake bite. And um, usually they can take care of it. They, they, uh, and, and the thing about dogs is dogs actually can take a snake bite a lot better than a person sometimes. Um, it's, it's, I guess it's just a trick of their physiology. <laughs> um, but yeah, just call your vet. That's, that's the best thing to do. And um, I have one more question and it says, um, I discovered a snake in my attic yesterday hanging out near my louvered type vent at the peak of my roof. It's where I know I have a resident bat. Do snakes eat bats? Yeah. Uh, rat snakes love to eat bats. Uh, we have, seen them uh, sitting at the entrance of bat caves actually in South Georgia where there's thousands of bats coming out and these rat snakes are actually hanging on trees and grabbing bats out of the air as they fly by. Um, so yeah, I suspect it's a rat snake. 
And uh, yeah, they, they will eat bats. She's pretty sure it was a rat snake, she says. So. Yeah. All right. That might solve one problem. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. No, snakes don't poop as much as bats. Right? <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean, they don't make as much of a mess. If you had to have one thing living in your house, uh, maybe the snake's a little better option. Yeah. Well, Daniel, we really appreciate you joining us today. And um, thanks for sharing all this information and these resources. And I hope that you have a great day. I'll share the recording with you once I post it, okay? Okay. All right. Well, Before thank you very much. Go, can mm -hmm. I let other people depart? If you have anything else you want to say, you can. But, um, but I want to ask you one more question before you go, just a, a work-related question. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'll let others um, log out. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, we are glad you were able to come, and I will follow up. In fact, right now, I'm going to put a link in the chat box for everybody to um, the survey. I'll send it out to you um, via email, too, but if you want to go ahead and take a quick survey about today's program, you can just go to the chat box and click that Qualtrics link to take the survey. So, um, Daniel, my question for you is not like, it's not a, I don't think it's a crazy question. I'm wondering, we have a set of those, their DNR and Georgia Power posters. And I have like a lot of different things. I have frogs and turtles and lizards and butterflies. And I had snakes and that was like the most popular one. Master Gardeners would take it out to, um, like local farmers market and it, it was the biggest conversation starter but we had to move out of our building last year and we packed everything up and moved it to storage and when we got back we have not been able to find that poster like it just disappeared do you know where I could get one of those <laughs> yeah we've probably got um we have a limited number of those Georgia Power printed a lot of those years ago and they're mm -hmm. kind of out of print but I think we it's have yeah. yeah, I think we have maybe a few left at the office. I can check and see and might, I might be able to like send you one. I'd pay you postage if, if you could. I'd send you a check. I, for we'll we'll, we'll just send it. Yeah, just send me an email with the ad address and stuff. Okay. And I'll, I'll look and see if we got an extra one. Great. I appreciate that. We have a bunch of the um, the snakes and I think there's a venomous snakes in Georgia publication that y'all have. Mm -hmm. And I have a bunch of copies of that. They've done a really good job keeping us uh keeping us stocked with those, but that poster is just really nice. I'd really like to have another copy of it and frame it and yeah. hang it in the office and be able to take it out to events. So. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Daniel. No, yeah, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate the invite. Yeah, we're glad you could come. We hope you have a great day. I'm going to end the meeting. If anybody still wants to click on the link in the chat box for the survey, um, I'll just hang here for just a second and otherwise I'm going to end the meeting. Master Gardeners, if you are on, we are going to sign into our Master Gardener meeting on a separate link in about five minutes. So I'll see you in a few. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.